Michael, good to see you after all this time. Good to see you, Robert. About one of my favourite people in Australian history, Mark Oliphant. Would you remind us what sort of scientific research was he famous for? So when I talk to people who don't know who Mark Oliphant is, um, I might have casually dropped in conversation because I don't have the surname that uh, I'm related to him and they ask what he did, I, I say, well, have you got a microwave oven? Because the cavity magnetron, which makes every microwave oven work, was an invention of Mark's team at Birmingham University when he was professor of physics there, but more importantly, it was invented as a tool for helping the Allies to win the war against the Axis powers because it's at the centre of microwave radar, which allowed you to take something that used to uh, be housed in a building and put it in the nose of an aircraft. He came back to Australia, which was very interesting because he could have stayed there indefinitely. Why did he come back? He came back and lots of people have commented that he really put a torpedo through a very promising and, and well remunerated research career by coming back to Australia. The fundamental particles that we use called protons are fired by means of this little cyclotron. But he felt that studying science and doing scientific research at a world-class level was an important capability that Australia needed to develop. Let me just quote to illustrate his idealism. He said, I have a deep confidence in the part which science can play in making us strong and prosperous. And he's talking about Australia, of course. And an idea that the proper use of science within its diverse territories may point the way to a secure and good life for all, for the community. The idealism is so strong. Indeed, the, co the community and um, the, the population of the world. And when you think about some of the scientific discoveries he'd been involved with um, in, in particle physics, in terms of the, you know, the team at the Cavendish Laboratories at uh, Cambridge that split the atom, um, his work uh, later on microwave radar at the University of Birmingham uh, and his work on um, putting atomic physics into play to, uh, as they felt at the time, uh, win victory in the Second World War. Um, his view of science and learning uh, was fundamentally connected to his view of the well-being of humanity and uh, the advancement of humanity in, in all fields. There's one paradox, though. He, very peaceful man, as you've implied, and I read that quotation, idealistic. And yet he was the one who recognised the problem of the bomb and that the Germans might get it. And he famously, although not in the movie, recently, in the movie. took the letter to America that made the Manhattan Project happen. You know, it's, was he always happy about having done that or was he conflicted? So, yes, you make reference to Oppenheimer, the movie, and if you watch the movie, uh, the story, uh, you know, really starts with Ernest Lawrence at Berkeley um, University in California. Uh, and it is true, my grandfather was the one who saw Lawrence as the one who would have the vision but also the political nous to sell the idea of uh, developing the atomic bomb to the Americans, which was the only allied power that had the, had the finances and scientific capability to carry it off. It was quite clear to everyone. Um, to answer your question, yes, he was conflicted about it, but what he would always say was what you need to understand is we were in a, a real war of survival against an ideology manifest in the Nazi regime and, and Adolf Hitler in Germany. Of course, we're here to celebrate the formation of the Academy of Science, and he was playing such a big part in that move, which they'd tried to establish in 1901, a long time ago. What did Mark manage to do that no one else could seem to bring off? I think there are several parts to that, but perhaps the most important one, um, the Royal Society played a fundamental role in 
connecting people and bringing the importance of scientific research to light and, and to the public consciousness. So he saw an example that he wanted to follow. He saw an example that he wanted to follow and he didn't think the answer was to nominate Australians to be fellows of the Royal Society in London. He wanted an Australian institution which would, uh, which would herald our excellence mm. and which would provide our home, as this place yes, does, yes. Um, for all of those high level, world level, uh, discussions and, and debates. That's why he felt it was important. So when the Academy was set up, of course, the Shine Dome was being built, this extraordinary structure. What did Mark say about the design? That was absolutely something that Mark was, was proud of. As most people know, it was quite a controversial design in its time, notwithstanding that Canberra was still developing architecturally and, and many of the national institutions we know in the parliamentary triangle today weren't there when the Shine Dome uh, was originally built. But he was he was tremendously proud of it and he saw I think the controversy associated with its design as a bit of a wake up call which helped him with his narrative about why things were important. Yes, Australia's got its own flying saucer. Australia's got its own flying saucer. Middle of town. And we've dared to do something different. We've dared to be experimental. And we're happy to be proud of it. And the Academy has this wonderful library, but he was strongly involved. In what way? He was very insistent that uh, part of the Academy's offering uh, and part of the Academy's importance as an institution would rely on the information that it held, including about the development of the academy itself as it went through the decades. So um, he personally insisted that the design of the building and the budget for running the academy included um, uh, strong allowances for uh, a proper library. They conducted most of their business by letter, so that's what this stack of paper Ooh. over here is. So this is Mark Oliphant's Academy-related correspondence for 1954. I'd be keen to dig yeah. into that correspondence a bit. Yes. <laughs> what do you think it would make of the work of the Academy? Were he able to comment today? He'd certainly have views. Um, I think he would hope that the Academy uh, would continue to develop its ability to broker important discussions and provide a platform for a reasoned debate on where the country should go and where the globe should go on some, some difficult and controversial issues. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Good to talk.